the of the month, we asked one of our certified lay ministers if they would share the Word of God with us. Miss Irene is our lay leader. She has been in charge for, till just recently, of our Sunday school. She is one of our anointers. She is a leader in our Stephen ministry. She wears a million different hats, and she loves the Lord Jesus Christ with all of her heart, mind, and soul. She's going to share the word with us before we have Holy Communion today. Irene? Well, welcome, everyone. It's good to see you all here in the house of the Lord. I can't think of a better place to begin the week, not just our day. Um, the account of the transfiguration is an amazing event, and I hope I can give you some thoughts, something to think about that may be a little different than what you've thought of in the past. Um, Jesus had taken three disciples with him. That's Peter, James, and John, who are closest to Jesus, part of his inner circle, you might say. And uh, he wanted to teach them something, to show them something, to boost them after what had been going on. Because the scripture said in verse 2, after six days. To me, that tells me I need to go back and look at what happened six days ago. So I went back into chapter 8 and found several things. Amazing miracles that Jesus had performed. One was the feeding of the 4,000. How amazing was that? All he had to do was bless the food. And he was able to feed them all. Now, after that happened, the Pharisees went to Jesus. And they, they were testing him. They tried him by telling him they wanted a sign. They didn't need a sign. He had given many, many signs. And if he'd given them another one, they would have just ignored it anyway. They didn't want to believe he was who he is. So it was just an amazing thing that shortly after that, his disciples were given a sign. They had not asked for any sign. They didn't demand anything of Jesus. They just trusted him and followed him. So he also healed a blind man. And when Jesus heals someone of blindness, I don't know if you've noticed it, but he never does it the same way twice. There's always something different in what he does. In this case, he used his spit to put it on his eyes. And the strange thing was it didn't heal him immediately. He first saw what he thought was trees. So Jesus put his hands on him again and then he was able to see very clearly for the first time. So Jesus had asked his disciples after that, who do people say I am? And of course, they mentioned that some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say a prophet. He says, but who do you say I am? Of course, Peter pipes up. He's the first one to speak. He may be the speaker for them all because he has the most, um, <laughs> I should say, the least inhibitions. So he said, the Messiah. So right then, he admits he's the Messiah. All the disciples who are there with him and all the others, Jesus doesn't deny it. He lets them know this is the truth. But he said this. He warned them not to tell anyone about him. He's done this many times. It wasn't his time yet for other people to know, just his disciples. So after that, he began to teach about his death, what he was going to suffer what he had to suffer, and that he would be put to death and raised again in three days. 
back then, if we had heard this, we were probably like the disciples, not understanding what he's really saying. How could they even fathom something like that? That's something that's never happened. It just doesn't happen. So they have all these things in their head. And of course, Peter pipes up and says, no, this shall not be. And of course, Jesus rebukes him. But the disciples believed that he was the Messiah. Unfortunately, their belief was that he came to free them and protect them from oppression. They did not realize, even now, that his kingdom was in heaven and that he would be leaving them to carry on his ministry. So as they traveled to the mountain where Jesus was taking them first, all of these thoughts must have been going through their mind. They must have been very confused and talking to each other about what they'd just seen and heard the past few days and what was going to happen. Can imagine how confusing they must have felt. And Peter, of course, after being rebuked by Jesus, had an extra burden to carry on his journey because of what Jesus said to him. He must have had some very strange thoughts and not sure. So the four of them, Peter, James, and John, and Jesus left the others when they got to the mountain. And they went up high up on the mountain, away from all the people, no distractions, nobody there to pull them. But Jesus and the disciples were very tired. So I imagine they were getting quite sleepy. But they were awoken <laughs> very quickly when they saw Jesus' face just glow. It was an amazing sight. His garments changed. Everything was different. It's um, an amazing transformation, like a very simple explanation is like the cocoon that turns into a beautiful butterfly. If you've ever seen that, you know what an amazing thing that is and how they struggle at first. And then they get their wings and they fly. So his glory was suddenly revealed his deity as God was being shown for the first time and probably the only time here on earth. Mark gives us a description that his clothes became dazzling white like snow. Other gospels describe the appearance of Jesus, the change in his face and in his clothes. They tell us the face of Jesus sown with the brilliance and intensity of the sun, God's glory, his Shekinah glory, reported to be so great, so bright, that when Moses was in his presence, he absorbed some of that light. <clears throat> and when he came down from the mountain, he glowed so brightly he had to put a veil over his face because the people couldn't look at him. And that's just from being near God. He couldn't see him either. So that indicates not a reflection of God's glory, but the source of the light the disciples are seeing is coming from Christ himself. It's his internal glory that they see for the first time. Jesus doesn't just reflect the brightness. He is the brightness of the glory of God. That same bright light blinded Saul on his road to Damascus. The good thing is, we, not, we may not see it now, but one day we will see it. And we won't need the moon and the sun and the stars for light. God's light will be all we need when we're in heaven. So then it says, there appear before them Elijah and Moses who are talking to Jesus. So just imagine 
the disciples are watching this display of light, and suddenly Elijah and Moses are right there talking with him. They're in conversation. Where did they come from? What were they saying? Luke tells us they were talking about what Jesus had in front of him when he reached Jerusalem. Probably listening to him or maybe encouraging him for what's coming. They understood being representative of the law and the prophets that Jesus had to die and they knew why Jesus had to die. They both had come from heaven and the amazing thing is that Moses had been denied the promised land. He's now standing on the promised land. Peter, of course, being Peter, says rabbi. Now that's interesting because he'd already said that he was the Messiah and now he's downgraded him to rabbi, teacher. You kind of wonder why he did that, but I guess it was appropriate at that time because right then he was the teacher. It is good for us to be here. <laughs> Let us make three shelters, one for you, one for Elijah, and one for Moses. Now in the first place, why would they need a shelter? They all came from heaven. They have more protection than any of us can ever even imagine. But Peter just didn't know what to say. And he had other things on his mind. So he finally gets to see this. And it's really strange because the scriptures don't tell us anything about James and John and what their thoughts are or what they're saying. So it kind of makes you wonder, they're being very quiet or are they saying things that we just aren't being told? So it's quite amazing that James and John are right there and just listening to Peter. Peter's got the lead. He just does that. So the stranger thing is, how did Moses know it was, or did, how did Peter know it was Moses and Elijah? They didn't have pictures. He'd never seen any drawings of them. Jesus did not say it was them. So how did he know? Well, what I think is that the Holy Spirit told him. Just like it was revealed to him that Jesus was the Messiah, it's now revealed to him that those two figures with Jesus on the mountain are Moses and Elijah. And, of course, Peter, he just really doesn't know what to say. So we do focus on Peter as well as Jesus and the two others. But they were really afraid seeing this marvelous thing, God's glory, seeing Jesus transfigured, seeing Moses and Elijah. It's not something we could describe to anybody. Would they believe us if we did? Would they understand? Could we answer the questions they asked? If it had been us, how do we respond to what they are saying, to what they need to know? But if you think they were afraid then, think about what their feelings are with what happens next. A cloud comes down, not just over them, but it envelops them. They're in a cloud. They cannot see out. And if anybody had been there, they couldn't see in. They're covered, enveloped in this cloud. And then a voice comes from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. They are cer certainly very shocked. But we hope that they understand the words Listen to him. They need to know that what he is saying comes from God. He does speak to us through scripture. He gave us his word. We are blessed to have this. We have the history. 
we have the prophecy for the future. We can see that the prophecies have been fulfilled, except one, when Jesus comes back. So he tries to tell them all of this. We are very blessed in this country to be able to study the Bible, to be able to meet here. We are so blessed that because the Bible, the scriptures, we are expected to read the scripture and to meditate on it, to ask questions, to try to understand some of these things just like the transfiguration. How could that be? That's just amazing. Especially the disciples not quite understanding who God, who Jesus was, that he was really God until that time. And only three of them actually got to see it and understand it for the first time. But they looked around and the cloud was gone. It just disappeared. And nobody else was there but Jesus. Elijah and Moses had disappeared. So on their way down the mountain, Jesus told them, do not speak of this to anyone. And so he does it again. He says this many times. Do not speak of it. And like I said, how would they? How could they explain what just happened? How could they know what to say? Would anybody believe them? Maybe some of the disciples would, especially if they also believed he was the Messiah. And then explain the, the brightness of God through Jesus, knowing that Jesus really is God. And what he's telling them is the truth, and that someday, soon, he would die. But he gave them hope by telling them, in three days I will rise again. He is our hope. He wanted to give them that hope. But still they didn't understand until he was risen from the dead. And then the words came back to them and they were able to share everything with the other disciples, with those who followed Jesus, so that they knew that Jesus is in the kingdom. He is their king. He is going to continue to be with them, guide them and direct them through the Holy Spirit who resides in each one of us. When they came down the mountain, though, this is going forward past the scripture, there was a crowd at the bottom of the mountain and they were arguing, teachers, said, I brought my, a man came out of the crowd and he said, teacher, I brought my son who is possessed by a spirit has robbed him of his speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground and he becomes rigid. So he brought him to the disciples and asked them to remove the spirit, drive it out, but they could not. And of course, Jesus rebukes him again, you unbelieving generation. And he says, Bring the boy to me. So they did. And the spirit saw that it was Jesus and immediately threw the boy into convulsions. But Jesus said to the boy's father, how long has he been like this? He said, from childhood. He's often thrown into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything Take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Is that where we are now? Do we have doubts and fears? Do we still not understand who he is and what he can do? This should help. He drove the spirit out. The child convulsed one more time. 
And then he lay as though dead. And people were afraid until Jesus reached down, took his hand, and he stood up, alive and well. Then they asked, why couldn't we drive out the spirit? Jesus said that this is the only can be done with prayer and fasting. And those are things, the disciplines, that we should have. We can see those types of things happening. We've seen miracles. We've seen cancer wiped out of people. We know what God can do. We know that Jesus is the glory of God himself. And the most precious thing is, we have that glory inside us, that power through the Holy Spirit. When we receive Jesus as our Savior and the Holy Spirit enters us, we have power from heaven. Amen. I love it as our different lay ministers share the gospel with us. I love the idea of the way the Spirit led you to end that message because we are beginning Lent and it is a time for us to practice those spiritual disciplines, seeking God's glory that is already within us. Things like prayer and fasting and service and humility and giving to others in the sake of the kingdom of God. And it all begins in corporate worship. Beautiful, beautiful illustrations. What a wonderful story. And Irene, you said something there, too, that I had never thought about. You know, we are so blessed, as you said, over here in the, the western part of our globe, that we have freedom here in the United States to have the Word, to read the Word of God. We are burning uh, to ash all of our prayer concerns this week to use for Ash Wednesday. And we have some old Bibles that we're using that are just tattered and nobody wants to throw them away. So we burn them as well, just as a sacrifice to God. There's places around the globe that would love to have those battered pieces of scripture that we have here. So you've said that since we have these things, God expects us to study them, to ponder them, to try to understand things like the transfiguration. Wow, that was an insight uh, for my spirit, I hope it was for yours as well. Let us take a moment of prayer. Father, we thank you for this wonderful transfiguration message that prepares our heart for the Holy Sacrament. We go into what we consider on the church calendar the most holy time of the year as we begin with Ash Wednesday and then the 40 days before Easter. We pray that your spirit would guide us to dig deep, to ponder, to consider the miracles and the spiritual disciplines of the Word of God. We give you praise and glory, and may all of God's children say, Amen. Amen.